itself as Krishna's discourse was over and thereafter the Gita is driven by Arjuna's questions like a class is over and then the QA session is going on now it is not necessary that say this if two questions are being asked now of course this is not a class in which there are multiple speakers there are, there are multiple audiences multiple listeners there's only one listener and that one listener is asking many questions but it is not necessary that the second question that a listener asks has to be related to the first question it can be it may not be mm -hmm. so the previous chapter was about what was the topic of the 11th chapter universal. sorry universal. yes universal form the virata rupa Now, after describing this, Arjuna is a very dramatic form and at the end of that dramatic form, what is Krishna uh, emphasizing? That this great, this, this form is wonderful, it's rare, but rarer still is my personal two-handed form. So, basically, there is Krishna has said that the, there is a materially all-pervading manifestation. All-pervading means that which is present everywhere. So there is a materially all-pervading manifestation. That is the Virata Rupa. And Krishna is saying that my two-handed form is more special than that. So then Arjuna has the question that what about the relationship between that same two-handed form and the spiritually all-pervading manifestation. What is the spiritually all-pervading manifestation? That is the Brahman. The Brahman is basically, what is the Brahman? The Brahman or specifically the Brahma Jyoti is the ocean of endless light that pervades all of existence and that comes from the form of the Lord that comes from the person Krishna. So that Krishna will mention specifically later in Brahmano Hi Pratishtha. So that will come in the 14th chapter. But basically, there is this all-pervading manifestation, which is the Brahman is spiritual. The Brahman is not material. The universal form, is it material or spiritual? Material. Can anything be connected to Krishna be material? Spiritual. Well, <laughs> see, it depends on how we are defining terms. There is material, spiritual. It can be defined in two broad ways. Mm -hmm. One is by composition. 
and the other is by connection connection or you can say application so for example Srila Prabhupada would say that the mic that we are using when we are using it for Krishna's service then it is being used for Krishna's service sorry okay so make it white what do I do This you should have told me before. There must be a way to reach this. Okay. <coughs> Is this better? Okay. Thank you for not being humble. <laughs> once I was giving a class and I, I went on for almost 25 minutes in the class and I could notice that in the back everybody was looking blank and even when you know, there was some humor in the class they just complete blank faces and I asked what happened they said you know the we can't hear you <laughs> <laughs> then I said, why did you tell me? He said, we thought we should be humble and not disturb you. <laughs> you know, if that is your definition of humble, then I have reason to grumble. <laughs> <laughs> because that notion of hum being humble will actually make us stumble in the path of bhakti. See, humble doesn't mean that we let anyone interfere with our service. That humble means that we don't let our ego come in the way of our service. Hmm. So, thank you for saying that. Maybe I'll keep the white always behind this class. So anyway, so spiritual and material can be defined in two broad ways. One is in terms of application. Now application, this mic, is if it is being used for Krishna's service, we can say it is spiritual. More precisely, it is spiritualized. But one character of spiritual is that it is eternal. Is this mic eternal? No. No, not at all. It is temporary. So, in terms of composition, in terms of what it is made up of, it is material. But in terms of connection or application for what it is used, that is spiritual. So, is prasad material or spiritual? And prasad is spiritual. But suppose somebody has diabetes and they take sweet rice saying it is spiritual. <laughs> then what is happening is, when, are they seeing it as prasad or are they seeing it as, you know, this is a tasty. If they are seeing it as prasad, well even rice is prasad. Why do you want to take only sweet rice? Isn't it? So there is a material component and there will be a material effect. Somebody who has diabetes, they take a lot of sweet rice. Even if they think it is prasad, it's going to cause a spike in their sugar levels. So, that, so in that sense, because it is the form of Krishna, it is a revelation by Krishna, we can call it spiritual. But at the same time, the entire components that are described over there, it describes the heads and the, the, the bodies of the various beings in the universe are described. Brahmaji is there, the serpents are there. All those beings that are described, they are material beings. I mean, they are material bodies of those beings that are described. So, in that sense, in the sense of composition, the universal form is made of material things. In fact, the universe itself is material. So, naturally, the, the, the universal form will also be material. So, it depends on how we are talking about it, from what perspective. So, yes, the universal form, from this particular perspective, in terms of composition, is material. The Brahman is all pervading. It is spiritual. It is also Satchitananda. So now, the question that Arjuna has is, okay, what is the relationship between your material, your spiritually all-pervading form and your personal form? Spiritually all-pervading manifestation, we can say. It's not a form, but it's a feature. So we, who are better? Those who are worshipping the impersonal or those who are worshipping 
the personal. So let's look at it. Arjuna vacha, Arjuna vacha, evam satata yuktaye, evam satata yuktaye. So those who are constantly engaged, how? Bhaktas tam paryupasate, Bhaktas tam paryupasate. So those devotees who are constantly engaged in worshipping you. As contrasted with them, ye chapya aksharam avyaktam. So aksharam and avyakta. Avyakta is unmanifested. That is the way of referring to that unmanifested reality is Brahman. Ye chapya aksharam avyaktam. Ye chapya aksharam avyaktam. Tesham, among these two people. Ke, who? Yoga vittamaha. So vittamaha is best or better. Among these two, who are better situated? Tesham ke yoga vittamaha. Tesham ke yoga vittamaha. So Arjuna knows that he is living at a time when there are many spiritualists. And he has seen spiritualists who are devoted to the personal form. And he has seen spiritualists, sages, who are devoted to the, who are dedicated to the impersonal. So asking Krishna, who among these are better? And the, the approach that Krishna takes is, in one sense, it's a cyclic approach. Like you can take, when you go on a spiral, say sometimes you can go, this is A, a and B. So, but the spiral means, first he gives the answer, first he emphasizes that the devoted are the best. Then he goes to those who are impersonalists. And then he comes back to the personalists. So, in one sense, he goes on a cycle. So, like sometimes uh, we ask a question. See, there is, there are two ways of answering a question. And generally, one is better than the other. First is, the better way is, you answer and then explain. But first, we start explain, you explain and then answer. So, what is the problem with that is, that, Suppose, say we have a question, you know, suppose we have a question, uh, is, the, is the Vedic tradition say uh, monotheistic or poly polytheistic? Do you worship one god or many gods? Now, if somebody starts going on a long winded explanation and they go to elaborate philosophy, throughout the person is thinking, you know, okay, so what is the answer? So it is best that first we give the answer and then we give the explanation. Mm -hmm. Now of course sometimes it might be better if the answer is going to be polarizing. That means you know the, if the answer is going to close the mind of the person. Then it is better to give some contextualization. Then build some backdrop and then give the answer. But for most times if a person is just inquiring and they don't have any biases or anything they just want to know. Then it's best to give an answer first and then give an explanation of the answer. So that is what Krishna is doing over there. So we see that Krishna's expertise as a teacher. So 1, 12.1 is the question. And then 12.2 is immediately the answer. And 3 to 6 is the explanation of the answer. So answer and then explain. So, what does Krishna say? Right in the beginning he says, those who are devoted to me are better. Now, significantly he doesn't condemn or reject those who are not devoted to him. Those who are impersonal is, he says, te prapnuvanti meva, that they too will attain me. However, the problem he says is, that this path is very difficult. So he talks about two things over here. That the path itself is difficult. And the progress on the path. Is distress inducing. Is That means. Say if somebody has to go up a mountain. And if they are going up the mountain. 
it is itself a very steep climb and so if it is a steep climb then that makes it difficult but if it is filled with sharp thorns and pebbles then what happens is the as you move up you are going to get cut also so both ways it is difficult so that's what krishna will say in 12.5 now let's look at that verse the impersonal path and then he'll contrast it with the personal path but so klesha adhiktaras tesham so for them for those people adhiktaras too much klesha is distress klesho adhiktaras tesham klesho adhiktaras tesham avyakta avyakta is the impersonal the unmanifest vyakta is that which is manifest avyakta is that which is not manifest avyakta asakta those who are attached to those who chet sam those who chet, consciousness is attached to the impersonal avyakta asakta chet sam avyakta asakta chet sam so he says avyakta hi gati gati is progress gati can mean destination gati can also be progress so progress towards the destination avyakta hi gati the progress on this path is distress in you see avyakta hi gati dukham avyakta hi gati dukham deha badbhir deha badbhir is those who have a body avapyate it is indeed that is that is how they find it deha badbhir avapyate deha badbhir avapyate let's say it together once klesho dhikar sesha avyakta sakta chetasa so here what exactly is krishna saying over here why is the path, why is saying the path is difficult and the progress is also difficult on that path basically impersonalism arises it arises from a misdiagnosis misdiagnosis of the problem see the basic problem that the fundamental philosophical problem there are many issues we can think about who am i what is the purpose of life and you know many people may think i know who i am i am a indian i am a young engineer and this and that i don't really care for that what is the purpose of my life okay i don't i have my purpose you know, i want to earn money i want to do this i want to do that among the various questions that philosophy has to confront you know there is the question of identity there is a the question of destiny what is the purpose of our life where are we going to go but the so these are important questions but the most universal question is the question of misery so identity some people may have the question distress destiny some people may have a question but misery almost everyone has that question that means why are my desires not fulfilled why am i unhappy why does unhappiness come upon my, in my life so this is a universal question in fact if somebody does not re realize the distress to some extent at least in their life then it's very difficult for people to even inquire about philosophy because if i feel life is just enjoyable then why do i need to seek for any meaning isn't it so generally it is a question of misery that impels people towards philosophy so and now why is there distress different traditions different religious traditions different wisdom traditions they have different answers to this question so the cause of distress what is its cause that is the question so now say if you look at the christian tradition they will say there is the original sin original sin means adam sinned against god by eating the forbidden apple most of you know that story 
so and their idea is that from that original sin sin is like a genetic defect that comes into all of humanity we may not do anything wrong but just by being born in the same succession from adam we are all contaminated by sin so that is one understanding of the cause of distress and then their solution comes up that somebody has to suffer for the sin so jesus has suffered for the sin and jesus died for that so then if we accept jesus as the savior then we will be freed from suffering but then the pro issue comes up that you know why should we have to first of all suffer for something that somebody else did is it somebody else did long long ago so i'm not going into a uh, elaborate uh, critique of christian philosophy i'm just giving you broadly an understanding of what is the cause of suffering now impersonalism impersonalism has the idea that that desire itself is the cause of suffering that why do we suffer because we have desires see most people think that think that because my desires are unfulfilled that's why i'm suffering you know i wanted to get uh, i wanted to get come first in my class i wanted to earn this much money i wanted to win this competition i wanted to have this woman as my wife so many things like that and it didn't work out so there is distress so this so in general even materialism acknowledges that there is distress but they consider unfulfilled desire as the cause of distress and they say if you can just fulfill your desires if you can just get enough resources to fulfill your desires you become wealthy enough you become smart enough you become strong enough Uh, then you can fulfill your desires you can be happy now within materialism there is the political right and there is the political left the political right says that it is the individual responsibility that you know you have to work hard in society there might be poverty but you have to work hard and you can change things you can become happy the left holds that it is social justice that society needs to be changed you know why are people unhappy why are people taking drugs it not because they are irresponsible but because they had a terrible upbringing because they lived in a bad neighborhood so oh because they were troubled by society so we need to change society either way both of them are focusing on material level see this is the broad idea when people say what is what should a government be doing it should be seeking economic development what is the point of economic development so that people will have resources to fulfill their desires now to some extent there is truth through this that for example if somebody is hungry and their desire for hunger is not fulfilled actually there will be distress and once we get food the distress goes away but each of these philosophies they have their issues the problem is okay the hungry people are distressed but are all the well fed people happy isn't it they have a hundred other problems which keep them from being happy so this is the problem with materialism now impersonalism holds that desire itself is the problem now bhakti holds that misdirected desire is the problem it is not desire but misdirected desire that now what let's try to understand the difference between these two So we are not going to into the Christian or Abrahamic religions. We are focused because the topic is personalism and impersonalism. So bhakti is broadly the same as personalist world. Bhakti means we accept that God is a person. So say somebody is sick and is in pain. Now what happens is maybe they have sick, maybe they have something like arthritis. and any moment ah you move your hand you cause some pain yeah move your legs it causes pain you cough it causes pain sometimes you go to sick person and you make a joke they laugh and they feel pain you know even laughing is painful so it's a terrible situation to be in. so what they observe is that where is my pain coming from the pain is coming from motion from movement 
So now their solution is suppose the patient says that if I just become motionless, then I can become painless. Now is that true? Well, partially yes, isn't it? If you give up motion, you will become free from pain. But the point is, how long can somebody just stay motionless? The after you become free from pain, then you want then the sick person will want to move, want to do things, isn't it? So the problem is not the so while it appears that it is motion that is causing the pain but underlying then there is a disease that is say arthritis so it is because the disease is there that's why when the disease condition there is motion then the motion causes pain now if somebody becomes disease free then they can have motion and still they can be pain free so the this is painless will make me motionless this is a misdiagnosis so similarly now impersonalists are also intelligent people materialists are just caught in the promises of material world i just fulfill this desire that will make me happy so their understanding is that distress is caused by desire therefore if i become desire free if i just give up all desire then i will become distress free now the problem with this idea is that after we become distress free you know, we want to do something if distress is there yes we want to remove distress but after becoming distress free we don't just want to live like that so actually underlying this is a disease the disease this is what the bhakti philosophy states let's put it this way not here disease that disease is disconnection from krishna and that disconnection from krishna has happened because of misdirected desire instead of desiring krishna we are desiring other things in this world and so now having desires is not the problem it's having misdirected desire that is the problem so now what happens is if we have if we become disease free then what will happen is so here like there is healthy motion when healthy motion is not only pain free but it can actually be joyful isn't it say somebody who becomes disease free and then they have healthy motion they can dance and they can sing and it brings joy they can express themselves and communicate and they can have a deeper connection that brings joy so similarly what happens is when somebody is this when our when we are disease free then we have healthy desires the desire to love and serve krishna the desire to use what we have in krishna's service and those healthy desires they will keep us distress free those desires will not cause us distress rather they will be, they will make us joyful when we desire to serve krishna this theme will come later in the bhagavad gita that but let's uh, focus this elaborate on this just now to make this clear that see what happens is if we are here now here there is a spiritual world and here there is the spiritual level of reality there is this krishna now when we desire krishna and then we desire things for krishna
desire things for Krishna means that you know we may want to build a big temple for Krishna. If we have a home, we may desire I want to have a comfortable home so that I can have Krishna a nice altar and then I can invite people and have programs in my home. So I want to have wealth or position or fame so that I can use that to glorify Krishna. Now these desires they are not at all bad. In fact if say somebody has singing ability then if they desire to sing to glorify Krishna then that is what actually the desire is meant for. The desire is meant to connect us with Krishna. Now the key over here is that the desire for Krishna should be greater than the desire for things for Krishna. Hmm? Sometimes I may want wealth so much I want to offer a million dollars to Krishna. And why? Because I want to express my love for Krishna. But the problem may happen is that in seeking to offer those million dollars uh, when I am not able to earn those million dollars, when my business deals don't go through, when my job doesn't pay me enough, then I might become so agitated that I may become disconnected from Krishna. But if we desire Krishna, it's like a parent may desire that, you know, for my child, you know, I want to have a big house with a large playground, where the child can play in the house, it's play in the properties. It's a fine of desire. But in that process, the parent starts working so much that the parent then has no time to spend with the child. The child may want to say that, Papa, I don't want a big <coughs> playground. I just want you to play ball with me at home. Spend some time with me. So if the desire to get a playground for the son becomes so big that the desire to be with the son goes away, then that will cause imbalance in the relationship. So if it is truly for the son, then the parent will not compromise the time they spend with the son. Isn't it? So similarly, if we are desire some, desire something for Krishna, then yes, we may want to desire something for Krishna, but that desire won't take us away from Krishna. And in fact, what happens is, just desiring for something for Krishna will actually lead us to remembering Krishna more and more. And this thing comes that actually speaking desiring Krishna that itself brings satisfaction because Krishna is the source of all happiness and the more we desire Krishna the more our consciousness becomes connected with Krishna and the more our consciousness becomes connected with Krishna the more joy we experience it like say if we consider Krishna is like an ocean of happiness mm -hmm. and say we are here now we may be thirsty now if our desire for Krishna is strong then the desire itself connects us with Krishna and the thirst is quenched but if other desires are strong then what happens is we are thirsty but we keep going in other directions and then we are not satisfied. So the wonderful thing about uh, desiring Krishna is that the, the, the desire for things need not be fulfilled, but still we can be fulfilled. See, this is this might seem a little complicated, but now you can think about this that that there is desire is fulfilled. Hmm? But that does not equate with heart is fulfilled we have this example sometimes we may, have, we may have a desire oh you know i want to buy this newest phone or i want to buy these clothes i want to get this bike i want to go this place that place maybe after a lot of work we fulfill the desire but even if you are fortunate to have the desire fulfilled but what happens is this is the material domain that at the material level the desire may be fulfilled but the heart is not fulfilled. In the spiritual domain, it can happen that the desire is not fulfilled. Still, the heart is fulfilled.
so because what happens is that the desire is not fulfilled the heart is fulfilled because what happens for us that desire is not as important as krishna that prabhupad wanted to build the jew temple for krishna prabhupad worked very hard for it and the temple now is in just 2 3 months away and that time prabhupad's body just gave up completely and one of his followers asked him swami you have any last desires is uh, not a disciple of a life member who asked him and prabhupad said kuch ichha nahi the prabhupad is that krishna had a part for me to play i have played my part even if the desire is not fulfilled not that that is causing a constant dissatisfaction for krishna for krishna's devotee so the point i'm making over here is this uh, we will we will try to look at desires again in another session but at this point the important point we are discussing is that impersonalism is based on a misdiagnosis that having desires itself is the problem therefore give up desires now what happens is now we may say what has desires got to do with personalism or impersonalism but if impersonalism holds that desires where do they come from how do they arise they basically arise from nama rupa guna and leela there are four root things say you know if we desire someone then we may hear the name of a person that person is famous oh i would like to meet that person or if we look at the look at somebody's picture hey they are attractive uh, i i want to i want to meet them i want to have a relationship with them or they may have some qualities they may be strong they may be smart they may be wealthy or leela leela it is used in a devotional sense as the past tense of the lord but leela is activity in general if somebody if somebody you know oh no this person Say, this person is uh, uh, climbs the mountains. Oh, I would like I would like to climb a mountain. I want to do this. I want to meet them. So, in general, desire arises from these four things: nama, rupa, guna, vila. So, what they say is that if all of these are considered Maya, then what will happen is there will be no desires. So, this is how impersonalism. solves the problem or attempts to solve the problem of distress what they say is distress is caused by desire and we need to give up desire to be free from distress but then desires naturally come when we see things therefore we should realize that the things that trigger our desire and the features of those things that trigger the desire all those features are false they are this is this illusion so this is impersonalism now the problem with this idea is that if you if we think about our thoughts think about our desires think about our emotions basically think of our inner life it's very difficult to think about it devoid of these four things nama rupa guna lila without that how can you think about anything suppose somebody asks you that you know okay can you describe the room in which the class is happening will think about maybe it's a large room it's a small room it has a it has a air conditioning in it then you can think of some features so when something is featureless how can you even think about it so that's why the very the concept itself is was very difficult to grasp that there can be some existence which has no qualities that which has which has no defining attributes to it that concept itself is difficult to grasp first of all and secondly that even if you say okay there is a concept like that but how do i progress toward this concept it's like uh, the only thing to talk is that there is nothing to talk <laughs> the only thing to think is that there is nothing to think so first of all the idea of the concept is itself that there is a reality with no attributes at all so this this concept is itself difficult to grasp and to contemplate this concept it is actually distress inducing it's like do 
nothing. Well, how do you do nothing? Isn't it? Because even doing nothing is doing something. Isn't it? So, so if somebody says doing nothing, so our reply should be nothing doing. <laughs> what that means is <laughs> that no, I am not going to have any part. Nothing doing means don't do it. No, I, I want to have no part about it. So doing nothing is just not possible. So that's why Krishna is saying over here that this impersonal path is actually very difficult to pursue. It's very difficult. So in contrast, he says that if you try to become devoted to me, then I will elevate you. I will liberate you. The next verse is Tesham Aham Samuddharta. I will liberate you and Bhavami na chirat path. Soon, not fast. So Krishna categorically says that the personal path is better because Krishna says, I will intervene. I will intervene and I will uplift you. So this is the first section of this chapter. This is one of the shorter chapters in the Bhagavad Gita. The 12th chapter has, anyone knows how many verses? 20. 20 verses, yes. So among these 20 verses, there are three sections. So 1 to 7 is the theme of mercy. Basically, in bhakti, there is mercy that plays a very special role. That mercy of the Lord by which he intervenes that is not there. So basically this chapter can be summarized in acronym MAT. M-A-T. So it is like a magic mat. Bhakti is like a mat. You know the magicians have this mat. You sit on that and you fly away. So Bhakti is like a magic mat. So now from 8 to 12. Krishna talks about how Bhakti is of very accommodating. It offers accommodation. There are, we talk about how there are multiple levels at which bhakti can be practiced. And the last is that bhakti actually brings transformation. Transformation even in this world, in this life. Not just liberation beyond this world, but transformation in this world also. So, we'll discuss these three features. So, we'll discuss the first part about mercy. Now this is the most philosophical part and let's look at it from a bit of a poetic perspective now. So among the two, those who seek you as the supreme person with devotion and those, see, those who seek the unending impersonal right through meditation, who O Krishna is better united with you? Those devoted to me are closer, that's my view. Those who pursue the impersonal also reach me in that manifestation. But difficult is their path and distress-filled is their progression. From the ocean of death, I deliver swiftly all those who offer their hearts to me steadily. Tesham Aham Samudharta. Now, this is the a section that was discussed. Now let's move to the next part of this. So basically, in bhakti, the idea is that we desire Krishna, we be absorbed in Krishna. So Krishna will offer now four <coughs> levels at which someone can connect with Krishna. There are multiple levels, but we'll focus on some of these levels. So the first Krishna says is that let your mind and intelligence be absorbed with me. Now, absorbed means it's natural. It's completely immersed. But if that is not, this is Krishna says 12.8. If you do this, you will, you are already living in me, Krishna says. That, it's not that you will attain me in the future, you are already attained me. Now, if somebody says that, oh, you know, constantly thinking about Krishna, that is not possible. So then Krishna says, is, you try to make your mind fixed. 
so this is intentional the mind will go away but you fix it up. now that is what this is where basically the sadhana bhakti that's what we do so for example when we are chanting the holy names when we are hearing classes when we are doing puja what are we doing we are trying to fix the mind of krishna hmm? now somebody say okay i can't do this also then krishna says work for me work for me basically is do seva so in many ways offering krishna the external is actually easier than offering krishna the internal that okay i may not be able to think of krishna but still it, i can come to a temple and maybe serve some prasad or distribute some pamphlets or do some service you know we are on the organizing festival set up this pandal do this do that doing seva is much easier work for me krishna says so this is 12.10 now if somebody says i can't do this also then krishna says work for some higher cause that means just try to cultivate some level of selflessness and krishna says by this also you will become gradually elevated so krishna is in one sense offering multiple levels anybody can cultivate a little bit of selflessness somebody may say okay you know i don't like to go to temple and uh, and distribute prasad over there. okay then if you see somebody hungry just give them a little food so work for some higher cause something beyond self what will happen by this gradually our consciousness will start expanding and ultimately by this we will come to krishna so krishna's mood over here is so accommodating see sometimes the idea is that it's like my way or the you have heard this highway highway means what get out you work according to my plan or you are on the roads so there are some religious traditions also who are like that they say that you have to believe that this person is the savior and if you don't believe this person is the savior then you are going to go to hell so it's literally like that my way or the highway but krishna is saying that there are actually many ways or other many levels if you can't do this do this if you can't do this do this so krishna is accommodating so krishna is in one sense his mood can be said over here from your place at your pace access my grace from your place at your pace access my grace so what we what is say for example shri prabhupad You know, he wanted to focus on sharing Krishna bhakti, but then Prabhupada also started a food for life program, and he said that okay, at least give food to people, you will try to give prasad. People may not be able to come to the uh, temple and chant Hare Krishna, but at least they can get some prasad. So that you give people multiple ways at, we, at which they can connect with. So that should be our mood. That is the mood of the Lord. so bhakti in that sense is very accommodating there are multiple levels at which one can connect with the lord and during shila prabhu uh, so uh, the idea here is that krishna just wants us to connect with him at some level or the other if not this this if not this 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 like that this krishna is actually very accommodating and this understanding of bhakti is now this does not mean that all the levels are the same that's a different idea isn't it that is that is a very superficial notion that all paths lead to the same goal that is not krishna is saying we talk about krishna is not talking about paths so much he is talking about levels 
ultimately you have to attain Krishna, but there are different levels that you can connect with. So, it's uh, one way to put it is that it's like say somebody is here and somebody wants to go to the top. Now, you could just go straight by a very sharp curve. You can go up if you have the capacity. Otherwise, you can go by a more inclined curve. You can go by even more inclined curve. You can go by even more inclined curve. So now, we could say this is going to take longer time. This is going to take much lesser time. If somebody wants to rise to the spiritual level where Krishna is present, to Krishna. So each of these will take different levels. So it's not exactly the same. But the idea is from your place. So wherever you are at, at your pace means you can go very fast up, you can go slowly up. But try but stay connected with it. Stay connected with me and keep rising upwards. So the eighth verse, ninth, tenth, and eleventh. These are basically describing different ways at different or other different levels at which you can connect with Krishna. So, ultimately, we need to offer our heart to Krishna. And that Krishna will, Krishna wants us to do that and Krishna will help us do that. But it will happen incrementally. It's not that Krishna says, if you are not going to do this, then get out, get lost, not like that. So, in Krishna's path, Krishna never says, get lost that is never says krishna says anyone who says get lost get lost you know you have no place in my my path you know krishna says to them you get lost the idea is that everybody has a place in krishna's journey in krishna's map in krishna's plan in Krishna's accommodation, accommodating arrangement. Now, what that place will be, that will differ. Will differ. Now, this doesn't mean that anybody can do anything and still they can be considered devotees. That is not the point over here. Hmm? Uh, we will talk about this in the next section. That what does accommodation mean and what does it not mean? Hmm? But let's look at this. So, best is to offer mind and intelligence to me as a loving present. You will live in me not only in the future, but also in the present. If you can't, strive to fix the mind on me through practice. Else, just work for me in a mood of sacrifice. If that is not possible, just dedicate yourself to some good cause. Knowing, self, knowing selflessness is for the self, always a gain, never a loss. So when we become selfless, actually we grow. We may be giving things externally, but our heart becomes enriched. Because we are growing in our consciousness, we are going closer to a higher reality. So this is how Krishna accommodates. Now after this, in the third section, Krishna talks about the qualities that endear a devotee to me. So he has said that anybody at any level is dear to me. Now having said that, the question comes that if we consider a graph, there is a devotion that is the uh, being attracted to Krishna, being dedicated to Krishna and then there are virtues. Virtues means good qualities. Now if we consider this to be a four quadrants, now if somebody has no devotion and no virtues, then what happens is they are, you could say, terrible people. This is what Krishna will talk later as the demoniac people. They have neither bhakti nor do they have any dharma. So devotion can be called as bhakti. Virtue broadly can be called as dharma. The word dharma has many different meanings, but uh, <coughs> traditionally dharma means a person. Dharma means order, harmony. So 
people who have virtues they live in orderly way so devotion and virtue krishna that the best is so this is terrible or we could say this is the worst now this is the best and krishna will say these are especially dear to me the devotees who have virtues devotees who have good qualities now let's look at the other two we'll, we'll come back to this once again but let's look at the other two characters now somebody who has virtues but they don't have devotion now is it possible of course it's possible isn't it can somebody not be polite they may not be devotee but can they be polite yeah they can be polite can some can somebody be charitable yeah there are there are atheists also who be charitable so can atheists be good people of course they can be good people but the, the challenge with this is that this is unsustainable so atheists may be good people but they are good people not because of their atheism it is in spite of their atheism that there is nothing in the atheistic world view to make a person a good person so atheism means okay there is no governing reality there is no ultimate reality then what is the idea then this life is all that we have and the pleasures of this world is all that are actually enjoyable then if that is the case then if i want pleasure and if somebody is coming in the way of my pleasure if i have the power to eliminate that person then why not do it so now that doesn't mean all atheists will do it but the point is if they don't do it it is not because of the atheistic world it is basically because they had some good upbringing maybe they had some some scars from their previous lives it could be because of various factors so atheists if they are good people it is not because of atheism it is in spite of atheism <coughs> now mm, <coughs> the problem however is that now you could say in some ways people who have devotion but they don't have virtues they are often the most problematic people why most problematic in one sense you can say devotion does good in the other world in the sense that if you are devoted we will go to krishna but virtues are needed for good in this world say if somebody doesn't follow the traffic rules they will be devoted somebody will be chanting hare krishna but they are not following traffic rules then they are going to disrupt the traffic they may cause an accident which hurts other they which hurt themselves so somebody has to oh they, if they are following rules then they help in bringing about order in this world so best is that we live in such a way that we contribute to the order in this world and we also seek a destination in the other world now what happens if somebody is a somebody is a devotee that means they want to worship krishna they want to love krishna but they don't have virtues then what happens they are they are it depends on the category of people and krishna will towards the end say that if somebody is just devoted to me somebody is that somebody just wants to stay fixed in me then they are dear to me also so krishna doesn't reject this people krishna accepts everyone with devotion so but there is accepting and there is appreciating so so it's like these are people who are assets for krishna these are people who are liabilities for krishna <laughs> now krishna accepts them that is his love <laughs> that is krishna's love but now why are the liabilities say you know if somebody who claims to represent god somebody is a devotee and they are very rude they are very arrogant 
then what is going to happen? They are going to alienate people. I think I mentioned this when I was in Mayapur. I was in Texas. Texas is a part of the evangelical belt. Evangelical belt is... How many of you were there when I spoke this point about Texas? Okay. Was it the Bhagavatam? Okay. Okay. Yeah, possibly the Maya Bhagavatam. So anyway, so... Basically, you know, uh, we from India think that America is a materialistic country. But actually, in the Western world, America is the most religious country. It's far more religious than Canada or UK or France or Australia or New Zealand. In fact, when I was in New Zealand and one Kiwi person was asking me, you know, okay, where all do you travel? So I said, I spent a lot of time in America. Oh, you go to America. They are all those religious nuts who elected Trump. So, <laughs> so then America, especially the southern part of America and the central part of America, it's quite evangelical and Christian mm -hmm. as compared. So, our perception of America mostly comes from Hollywood, which is mostly the coastal part of America. So, America is almost like two countries. But the point over here is in many of these Christians, not all of them, but many of them are they're evangelical means they're very pushy. So they try to push their religion on everyone else. And then so I was in Texas and I uh, there was a I was going for a program, there's a car in front of me. And in that car there's a on, there's a bumper sticker or a bump, and there's a coat over there. They said, Oh God, please save me from your preachers. <laughs> so normally God saves us through his preachers is it they give God's message but the idea is these preachers are so troublesome so imposing so disagreeable so arrogant I don't want anything to do with me so God my prayer is to you is please keep these preachers away from me so what happens is so people who are not well behaved they may be devoted but quite often they will alienate others. They will, uh, seeing them, people will think, I don't want to become like this. And if devotees are like this, then I don't want to be like this. So that is, now see, if you see Krishna's concern in the Bhagavad Gita is also to establish order in this world. Dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. So therefore Krishna needs in his mission, devotees with virtues. Devotees with virtues. So the qualities that Krishna is talking about over here, these qualities are not so much devotional qualities as they are behavioral qualities. So, what does it mean devotional qualities? Krishna is not saying over here, though, who are dear to me, those who wake up in the early in the morning and come for Mangalarti. Those who chant 16 rounds. Or those who worship the deities. Those who fast on Ikadashi. These are good things. They are important things. No doubt. But is it the world doesn't care. World, world doesn't care what we believe. One of the, the modern attitude towards religion that is can be summarized in one sense don't tell me what you believe you know everybody has their own belief systems and everybody tries to prove that their belief system is the highest don't tell me what you believe rather show me how you behave show me how you behave that is much, much more important. That's why Srila Prabhupada, once when he was asked by a journalist that, how do we know your followers? And Prabhupada said that they are perfect gentlemen and ladies. That means they are well behaved. So being well behaved is not just a trivial matter. It's an important matter. So most people, they can't perceive our transcendence. Isn't it? How much devotion somebody has for Krishna, people can't perceive that. But what people perceive is that how well behaved are you? And you know, those who have some Hindu inclinations, many people are concerned that say people are many people are converting to Christianity. And 
is that a concern here also? Is it a part of the discussion? That like Ghar uh, Wapsi kind of Andolan and all those people do that. So now the idea is that there are many reasons for this. But, uh, but one reason, we can't blame Christians from being missionaries and trying to convert. They are doing what they believe is the right thing. They are sharing the message of Christianity. But one key factor often is that you know, many Christian priests, they are very well behaved. In contrast, many Hindu priests are very judgmental. So I was in, uh, don't touch me, I was in, uh, and I was you know, talking in United Raul Kela, a huge talk, several thousand students were there. So after that, it was a nearby guest room, and then the students came to meet me. And one of the boys was talking with me, he says, you know that, he was telling me his experience. Now actually before that what happened was, there were several boys were talking with me, and then one boy was standing outside. And I could see he was having questions, but he was not coming into the room. I said, do you have some questions? He said, yes. He said, come in. And then he looked, he looked at me, he looked around, the boys looked at me. And then, one of the boys and Kero told me that, you know, he, he is from a village and he is from the untouchable caste. I said, who cares? I said, so instead of calling him, he said, I just went up and walked up to him and embraced him. I said, please come in. And I said, you answer your question first. And then after that, the other boys talked that their whole question started changing. And one of the boys he said that, you know, when we come to the Jagannath temple, it's like all the pandas, they are asking for money, they are asking for money, they are asking for money. They are not interested in us, they are only interested in our money. But he said, I, I wanted to study the Bible, I wrote a letter, and after I wrote a letter, actually one Christian came personally to my home to deliver me the Bible and he talked with me so nicely and then when I expressed some interest then the he arranged that when I went to the church for the first time the head of the church that the bishop he personally met me and spent time with me so he says in which Indian temple if you go to the Mandhadipati will come and meet you so what happens is People want to feel a sense of connection. People want to sense of, feel a sense of belonging. And if we don't offer them that, people are going to go where they get it. So, behavior is important. Now, I am not saying here entirely that all Christians are well behaved. Nor am I saying that all Hindu priests are ill behaved. Now, there are, I have met many, many Hindu priests and Hindu teachers also who are very well behaved, who are very saintly, very kind, very helpful, very warm. But I am just giving this as an example to illustrate at the ground level in this world that the Vedic teachings may be far more comprehensive than the Christian teachings. But most people do not join a religion or an organization or a path because of how excellent its philosophy is. Most people join for many other factors. And one of the factors is how, how they are welcomed how they are valued, how they are treated. So this point Krishna is saying that our behavior is very important. So Krishna is saying that when we learn to behave properly, the whole list of qualities is focused on, Krishna says that one who is kind to everyone, one who does not hold any enmity towards everyone. In fact, one key verse Krishna says is that, yes ma, let's recite this verse and we'll conclude with this. This is the fifteenth verse. Yasman means by whom. Na udvijate loko. By whom people are not disturbed. Yasman no dvijate loko. Yasman no dvijate loko. And lokan by people. Na udvijate is not disturbed. Chayaha. That's not such a person. Loka no dvijate chaya. Loka no dvijate chaya. Then, har, then the various disturbances are described. Harsha, amarsha, bhayo, vegaira. Harsha is jubilation. When somebody listens to me, somebody agrees with me, somebody does what I am saying, I feel so powerful, I feel so happy. If some, nobody listens to me, but the person doesn't agree with me. Amarsha. Hmm? And 
if say somebody makes an argument that I can't refute, then what happens is I become insecure, I become fearful. Oh, you know, if this person, my conviction comes only by proving that you are wrong. If I can't prove that you are wrong, then maybe I am wrong. And if I can't get you to listen to me, then I become filled with fear. See, fanatics are not people who have too much faith. They are people who have too little faith and use too much force. Why are people fanatical? Because if you don't agree with me, then your very existence is a threat to my belief system. So, so it's not that too much faith is not so much of a problem. It is too little faith with too much force. So this bhaya, this bhaya comes what? In one sense, faith can never be too much. Faith is always a good thing. Of course, blind faith is not a good thing. But it is, fanatics are characterized by too little faith and too much force. So, that, that is a key characteristic of fanatics. So, the buyer, if I start feeling insecure just because I can't convince anyone, then what will happen is, I will become very aggressive towards that person. Harsha, Marsha, Bhaiyo, Dvegair. Okay, sorry. So, Dvega is agitation. So, Harsha, Marsha, Bhaiyo, Dvegair. Harsha, Marsha, Bhaiyo, Dvegair. Mukto. So, I said one who is free from all these disturbances. Yaha, Sacha, Me, Priya. Such a person is dear to me. Mukto, Yaha, Sacha, Me, Priya. Mukto, Yaha, Sacha, Me, Priya. So, let's recite it together. Yes, ma no dvijate loko, loka no dvijate chaya, harsha marsha ayo dvegay, mukto ya sacha me priya. So now, here the key point is, is the nature of life is that when two people are in a relationship, what will happen is, I will disturb you and you will disturb me. That is just natural because you know, I will do something which you don't like and you will do some things which I won't like and this is the normal state of relationships. But Krishna is saying, how should a devotee act? A devotee, it says, don't disturb and don't be disturbed. Now how to do this actually? Don't be disturbed. It is when our security, our strength, our satisfaction is coming from our relationship with Krishna. If this is the source of our strength, our satisfaction, our security, then what happens is, even if the other person does something which disturbs me, you know, I won't get disturbed. But if I don't have that vertical connection, if somebody disrespects me, if I am myself not confident in my relationship with Krishna, that people may disrespect me, but Krishna still loves me, Krishna still accepts me. Then what will happen is, how dare you disrespect me? I will become very aggressive, I will get very disturbed by that. So, and then we often disturb others because we want, we need, our security comes from getting people to agree with us. So that's how we end up causing too much disturbance or getting too much disturbed by others. So, the sometimes, some people have the idea, preaching means to disturb others and to be disturbed by others. Well, that means people are in ignorance, you disturb them. And seeing how much people are in ignorance, we should get disturbed. Well, that's one aspect, you know, that's a very small aspect. We should not be disturbed, we should be concerned. There's a, there's a big difference between the two. So, preaching means we should not be disturbed by others. No, but we should be concerned about others. Hmm. 
so when we are concerned then our with that concern our focus should be how to elevate them not how to agitate them now you remember uh, in the morning i talked about if we, if we give premature instruction too much advanced instruction then what happens is people will start rising up will go down so if we are concerned our focus will be on how to elevate them not how to agitate them now sometimes a little bit of agitation may be required so that we jolt the people out of out of slumber we awaken them but the overall focus in the relationship should not be agitating others it should be helping people so that they feel accepted and they can be elevated so uh, sometimes we hear about prabhupad confronting and smashing people and is prabhupad did that but if you hear prabhupad's memories that means the devotees who have remembered prabhupad we will find that what they remember the most is not how prabhupad called this people a fool and called that person rascal so what they remember about what they treasure really about prabhupad is in their personal memories is how prabhupad was so warm how he was so loving how he was so kind that's what they treasure so it's important that we have this understanding krishna says that when we are when we are kind we are helpful when we are elevating to others such a devotee is dear to him so krishna will go on in this series and finally he will say that if we are to be undisturbed that means we are we stay fixed among dualities honor dishonor and gain loss and ultimately we stay connected with him if you are connected with him krishna says just that connection will mean that you are dear to me but if that connection is with virtue then you become even more dear to me dear to me are those who are devoted when with virtues they are decorated when they are kind to an everyone and have envy toward no one when to others they cause no agitation and don't let others cause them agitation when material profit and loss they see as equal and amid praise and criticism both they stay stable when they stay unne uh, when they stay unaffected amid duality of any kind immersed in me the ultimate reality who is always coming that is krishna sarvadam sarva bhutana he is the well wisher of everyone so i'll summarize what we discussed today broadly we discussed chapter 12 and within that the first point we discussed is about that the question arjuna's question that krishna first answers and then explains and that is the best way to not let the person stay hanging and then we also discussed about how this question comes from the previous chapter that he is talking about the all pervading versus the personal form the contrast between them so all pervading the material that is discussed in chapter 11 and all pervading spiritual that is discussed in chapter 12 so the all pervading material is the universal form there we discuss material spiritual it can be understood through composition what is something made of or it can be understood through connection or application what is it used for then after that we discuss about the whole concept of impersonalism so impersonalism is based on a misdiagnosis so the cause of distress different philosophies have different ideas the christian world view holds that it is it is the original sin that is the cause of distress materialism holds that it's unfulfilled desire then impersonalism holds that it is desire itself 
and the bhakti tradition personally hold that it is misdirected, misdirected desire. desire so we discuss how uh, the patient of the the example of the arthritis patient he thinks that the motion is the cause of pain but the motion is not the cause of pain what is it it's a disease so it is not desire that is the cause of pain it is misdirected desire that is the cause of pain and we discuss the difference between that that when there is at the material level versus at the spiritual level material level what happens is it's like a desire is fulfilled but still heart is not fulfilled hmm. but at the spiritual level the desire may not be fulfilled but if our desire for if we have the desire to serve krishna desire to connect with krishna then our heart will be fulfilled so that is the speciality so this the desire for krishna itself is uplifting it is satisfying it is liberating then we discussed about the how krishna is accommodating so so rather bhakti is or krishna is accommodating so we discussed the acronym was m a and t so m was mercy this is talked about from 1 to 7 the a accommodating was from 8 to 12 so we discussed broadly four levels what are the four levels do you remember so like absorption then then concentration or focus practice so absorption is effortless concentration is effortful then other is service service for krishna service to krishna and then it's any kind of selflessness so all of these can elevate now they are not exactly the same path is are like paths at different degrees of elevation so from your place at your pace access krishna's grace so krishna is accommodating and we all can in one sense when we are practicing bhakti we largely practice bhakti at these two levels that we are we are uh, doing sadhana for some time and then our remaining life we are trying to serve krishna so then the last three was transformation this is the transformation means bhakti actually brings transformation even in this world so those devotees who act in this way they are the most dear to krishna so we discuss this four quadrants there are virtues and there is devotion and dharma and there is bhakti so these are krishna says they are dear to me these are the people who are assets to krishna the those who have devotion but not virtue they are liabilities often because of them people go away from krishna krishna doesn't tell them to go away krishna accommodates them that is his kindness now these are in one sense the worst because they are they often become demoniac and the those who have they are good this is unsustainable there nothing in the world view to do that keep it for them and then we discuss how when we are practicing bhakti what people see is not what is what people see is not what we are believing but how we are behaving and the more we can cultivate sadachar good behavior then we will find that people will be attracted and the idea and then lastly we discuss this point of how to behave properly it's important that in our interactions with others we be strongly connected with krishna when when our connection our relationship with krishna is strong and we are getting our security our strength and our satisfaction in that relationship then we can be don't disturb others and don't be disturbed by others we can actually do this and thus we can uh, for function harmoniously in our lives thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna are there any questions please we had a question regarding this quadrant of devotion and devotion are you sure we had a question regarding this quadrant of devotion and devotion 
So um, I have seen in the what what I have heard from previous things that uh, with devotion these uh, virtues, natural virtues of being very humble or in humanity, the virtues of being. Correct. Good point. Yeah. So when devotion so, virtues come, yes, that's well known. Was hara or bhakta se puto mahal karna yes, yes, se bhakti bhagwat te kinchan. That's true. Now, if you look at the verse in context, what is that virtue? The verse say the verse is basically in a passage where it is comparing different paths, and the emphasis is that if we are practicing bhakti and we see somebody else with a path on the path of jnana who seems to have good qualities, or we might see a karmi who has good qualities, the point is don't give up the path of bhakti to take other paths. but you know we can have a bhakti itself we can either have a very limited view of bhakti limited means you can say bhakti means just devotional activities bhakti means chanting doing puja but we can have a very inclusive understanding of bhakti bhakti means anything that is favorable for us as krishna that helps us sir krishna anukulyasya sankalpa anything that is favorable so now is cultivating virtues favorable yes it is then why not do it so say if uh, we want to build a temple for krishna then we may want to know how to learn architecture or how about we need to need to something about architecture then will we say that oh if i just chant an arikshna architectural knowledge will come with me no it won't for practical functioning in the world we need that architectural knowledge so we should see if somebody is building a temple they should say oh i'll just chant arikshna temple will be built no they have to raise funds and they have to take responsibility to make sure the architecture is done properly If somebody goes to a country or a place where the language of normal conversation is different, then they have to learn that language if they want to communicate, or they have to at least develop a relationship with somebody who knows that language well and who can translate for them. Is it? That's a part of our service to Krishna. So, what applies for say external skills like language or architecture? Why is it that we can? So that is so grossly material, but. we use that krishna service then which is actually subtler like say politeness oh why can't we learn that so i say that we don't limit bhakti we have a very inclusive understanding of bhakti when it comes to things things can be used in krishna service so if my intent is good eh, i may learn how to operate a camera i may learn how to use a tablet how to make a powerpoint and so that i can do for bhakti but how to become a little more humble no i'll just chant hari krishna and i'll become humble why then a why why do we say that isn't it so why limit bhakti that way bhakti means anything that enables us to serve krishna better so we do that so what is what is being said in those verses is that don't give up bhakti just to develop some virtues don't don't think that the path of bhakti is inadequate just because you see virtues in some other people who are not practicing bhakti the point is yes that those virtues will manifest in a devotee but if those virtues are specifically required for our service then what's wrong in focusing some effort in developing them that's just a part of our that's a part of our bhakti Probably can we say that uh, for uh, one who aspires to be go very high in devotional service, uh, one must need to cultivate virtues. Hmm. You have seen that. No. I can't come. I would say that yes. Uh, one who is just to go very high in bhakti, that is also required, and especially one who wants to serve Krishna in this world. If you want to now, if somebody is a somebody is a, just a bhajanan. and somebody just uh, wants to chant and they don't really care for the world then even if they maybe maybe a little rude they may be a little harsh with people it doesn't matter but if somebody wants to connect with people then 
so is it for going high in devotion i would say that it's uh, especially behavioral qualities and sometimes we may see very advanced devotees who may not have behavioral qualities and we should not minimize their devotion because of that right? so like some people are avdhutas right? they are just uh, it was just too transcendent they don't care for normal behavioral conduct rules can they have devotion we can have, they can have devotion but avdhutas they cannot really be see ityan prabhu's compassion is our standard but ityan prabhu's particular behavior is not our standard <laughs> so uh, avdhutas can also be great devotees but if somebody wants to make a significant contribution to krishna in this world then virtues are important Yeah. I have a question on karma yoga. Yeah. Can we come to karma yoga later? Because we are going to discuss that right now if we go to bhakti yoga. The fourth, fourth, fifth chapters are going to be a karma yoga. Yeah. Uh, Prabhu, like, it's a simple application with today's question. Like, uh, generally, uh, when we are doing the devotional service, it's for Krishna. But when we do our uh, general activities as a student, uh, like studying, etc., it's for the purpose, other purposes, like which may be material, like placements or something. So how can we gradually induce some changes so that they come to the platform of Seva? Can you give an example of what you are trying to say? Uh, like, uh, for example, I am preparing for like a particular exam and I am just madly into passion that I want to get into this college and something. So it's basically a materialistic desire. How can we gradually induce some changes so that it comes to the like it becomes a service of God. Well, desires are complicated. Each person has to decide how strong that desire is. So, in general, there are three broad with respect really with desires. It's an art. Art means that some desires can be accommodated in bhakti. Some desires I need to be rejected for bhakti and some desires are transcended by bhakti. So that means what? This is a whole broad session in itself. But what it means is that if some desire is very strong for someone, like say somebody comes to engineering, see most people come to engineering not because they are very greatly interested in engineering. They are mostly interested in getting having a good job and having a, having a relatively good lucrative career. So for them, they need not become very immersed in engineering. Okay, this is your job. Do the job and focus on bhakti. But somebody has a very deep passion for that field. They are immersed in that. Now, maybe they can serve Krishna by becoming a engineer or a researcher or a scientist. And if somebody wants to spectacularly success, succeed in a particular field, they have to be immersed in that field. But then, at that time, so sinful desires, for example, they have to be rejected. So desires involving, say, understanding sexuality or meat eating, they have to be rejected. But desires which are involving material ambitions, some of them may be accommodated. So if somebody has a very strong material ambition for something, the important thing is you maintain the basic spiritual connection. That means we associate with devotees, we do some, uh, a basic level of sadhana. And then those desires we pursue. And we don't know whether they will succeed or not. But sometimes what happens is some desire, if it is very deep rooted within us, and if we don't pursue it, then that can cause a lifelong dissatisfaction to us. I should have done that, I should have done that, I should have done that. So each person has to weigh how much is the agitation. Like some people may feel, you know, pursuing this desire is so much trouble, just forget it. And, you know, it's not going to give me much satisfaction, so why should I do it? But if somebody, there's a deep longing for something within them, so not pursuing that desire can cause them a far more agitation. And they pursue that desire, that's fine. Say so when Arjuna pursued archery, hmm, he pursued it with one pointedness, that famous incident when Drona asked all his disciples, what do you see? And Arjuna said, I see the eye of the bird. Now Arjuna didn't say, I see Krishna. Is it it? So, why? Because, yes, ultimately that skill was meant for Krishna, 
but in that particular case he has to say i see i am the but that's what is required for the service you know if i got a somebody has got a heart attack is a devotee heart surgeon they they do heart surgery what do you see no i see krishna in your heart <laughs> well okay but do you see what needs to be fixed in my heart right to visit it <laughs> so you see krishna that is wonderful but you need to see what needs to be fixed over here so some people are immersed in a particular field then they need to talk with the particular particular devotee guides and find out you know what level uh, of spiritual connection they is is like you could say that's fundamental that's non negotiable and beyond that they may focus on serving uh, they may focus on pursuing their particular career so if we stay spiritually connected then krishna will gradually give us the realization by which we can actually uh, harmonize that particular desire with krishna thank you thank you krishna so transcendent means this is like purification so sometimes i may have a very strong desire but as i keep practicing bhakti that desire just decreases and goes away so some desires so like this this is natural decrease hmm? this is conscious no and this is like a planned mm, careful yes hmm? hari krishna prabhu prabhu ji like krishna's convert um, convert the most of people for their religion and same thing uh, we tra- we transform the people hearts uh, but we know that it is this knowledge is highest order and it should be given to the people so it is uh, uh, krishna also thought also think that their knowledge is highest and what is the di- difference between them and us who thinks they are the highest krishna think they are the highest what are you saying krishna think that uh, krishna yeah. uh, uh-huh. krishna consists is highest it should yeah. be given to the people so what is the purpose of krishna uh, christians to convert the people now you see every religious tradition will think that their path is the best and that's why they will try to convert everyone else so now our understanding i was going to discuss this in uh, tomorrow's class let's this specific question about how to see different religions we'll talk about it the tomorrow so but their purpose of conversion is they believe that jesus is the only way and they are trying to save everyone now, of course that's not the only motive that the, the religion is also gets mixed with politics and power and other things so that ulterior motives also come up so but at their core they are doing what they think is good for everyone now are the method that they use necessarily good sometimes they deceive people sometimes they allure people that's not good but i, I so everybody operates according to their conviction we'll talk about this tomorrow more tomorrow morning session 4 11 we'll talk about it we'll discuss this company so uh, uh, you said about don't get like this talk by others but uh, sometimes uh, like non devotees uh, like engage in some kind of quarrels or fights with uh, us uh, like uh, us as so like we can get uh, like agitated and uh, he he can also cause like some kind of loss to us if we don't take some action so like till what limit we should uh, see when he says don't be disturbed that is more t- talking about a mental level don't get too worked about it but at a practical level we have to take the necessary action arjuna doesn't think that has, don't be disturbed by other that means you know durudana has committed so many crimes i will not be disturbed so let us not fight the war no the point is don't be disturbed means don't be disturbed from our duties our responsibilities so if somebody is interfering with our responsibilities then we have to deal with them appropriately so for example you know if we are we are giving a talk spiritual talk and somebody starts and creates a lot of disturbance so speaking noisily arguing now we don't have to start yelling at them but we may have to do the appropriate thing you know can tell them that you know, say you have a different view and since you don't agree with this there are others who have come to hear about about what the bhagavad gita teaches so you can feel free to leave. if you want to stay please listen afterwards we can have a private discussion so we may have to set some boundaries so when krishna says don't be disturbed it doesn't mean be men- physically passive it is says mentally don't get so consumed by it that you can't think clearly that you can't act wisely so any other questions
Yeah, get the mic here, please. You had a question there? No, no, please. You come, yes, please. Uh, Prabhu, you told that uh, one uh, the impersonalist, uh, they get, uh, they when get, they have this notion that desire causes the problem, and when they fulfill, they get their goal, like they can again desire to do something. Like after they achieved uh, whatever they wanted, like more liberation, they can again have the desire. But Prabhu, now who says this? Us. After impersonal, they can have the desires. No, that's not what impersonal is saying. Uh, they say just all desires have to be permanently given up. Uh, like you gave up the, uh, sorry, I misframed the question. Yeah. Uh, you gave the analogy with the arthritis person uh, that uh, when he get healed, uh, like his notion is that the pain, emotion is giving me the problem. So when, let me frame the question. Right? You want to frame the, or you want to? He is saying that uh, although the impersonalists think that uh, desiring, uh, lack of, uh, without desiring we can uh, live happy, being peaceful, but one who is not in motion, the moment he will be free from the pain, he will again desire. So, how it can be understood, right? So, so the impersonal basically, that's why uh, the Bhagavatam also the impersonal liberation is especially those who think I am liberated because I, I become free from desire. They often come back. They often Aruya Kruchraina Parampadam Patantya They fall back because you know, it's not a very stable position. So when they get a desire, uh, then where do they go? They don't know about Krishna or they don't accept Krishna, then they can't go towards Krishna. They go, they have to come back to the material level only. Okay. No, but the point is that here the Bhagavatam verse is talking about those who are still in the material world and they they get a recurrence of desire. Like somebody may say, I get samadhi, I got liberated. But then they they feel, okay, what liberated is what am I going to do? Then they start doing humanitarian work, they start building opening hospitals and the opening hospital is not a bad thing. But that's not intrinsically a spiritual activity. So, somebody is free from desire, they can enter into the Brahman and they stay in the Brahman for as long as they don't have any desire. But afterwards, Prabhupada will say that sometimes they just become lonely over there. And then what do you do? It is peaceful, but how long can it be peaceful? So it becomes a problem over there. So, like uh, having a desire to be with someone is also a desire, now, but they got that position only because they don't have any desires. Yeah, but the point is that consciousness is not static, it is dynamic. Just because I have no I have become free from desire now, does that necessarily mean I'll be free from desire forever? It doesn't necessarily guarantee that. The ideal situation is I can become free from one desire and I can stay free if I am filled with some other desire. When I am when somebody is addicted and then say it's, it's uh, you know sometimes people say substances cause addiction like alcohol causes addiction or drugs cause addiction it's not that simple Krishna says lust is not present in the sense objects the last Krishna doesn't say lust is present in women he says it's present in our own mind senses, mind senses and intelligence it's inside us so, it like people get addicted to gambling, to playing cards. And do we want to ban cards? Cards cause addiction, so we ban cards. And no, isn't it? You know, it's that cards are not causing the addiction. It's the people's minds who are, which are getting addicted. So we can't. Now there is a difference. You can say between cards and drugs, and drugs can have a lot of harmful effects to the health and other things. We are talking primarily of the addictive property. The addictive. So that there should be some regulation about alcohol and drugs, and that's all right. But I am talking about the principle that the desires, you say somebody is addicted, it is addicted not just because the substance is present, it is because the desires inside are strong. Mm -hmm. So it's like in the Vietnam war when many Americans went, the very terrible conditions, many of them were taking cocaine and other things over there. And there is a great fear that all these soldiers when they come back they will be addicted. But you know, it, was, it was a very difficult situation for them over there and cocaine was there with the way they were co coping with it 
and then when they came back almost 90 percent of them gave it up now, of course 10 percent still said addicted and that's right so my point is that sometimes the desire so what happened is where they, they, the only thing they had to do was a painful dangerous fight with everyone they need something to cope with it but when they came back to be with their families they had a more peaceful more organized more meaningful life not filled with so much pain and fear and danger then they didn't need a coping mechanism so when they had other desires filling the other things filling their consciousness then this desire didn't recur but if somebody came back and they had no family to come back to maybe their family had passed away or they were too long away their wife divorced them and left them whatever then quite often if they had nothing to fill their lives then their cocaine took over their life so my point is that we can become free from desire at one particular point but consciousness dynamic unless it is filled with some other desires we may relapse towards our older desires that, that can happen to the impersonal souls okay okay lot of questions we will okay these four questions i'll try to finish with you. yeah uh, some uh, impersonalists say that uh, some impersonalists say that uh, through uh, practice of meditation, like uh, if our desires are get lowered, if our thoughts are get lowered, we we make our minds still, and in that still state of mind, as as more as we make still our mind, that such a state of mind is so receptive and is uh, like for example if someone is uh, someone is traveling if he is traveling so much fast then if he is traveling fast he is not able to uh, see the surroundings very properly so that if he travels so, so still so still so that you can able to perceive things very uh, uh, consciously yes. so in that state of mind when you become so still so your consciousness will naturally grow and in and your intelligence knowledge will naturally come up so that you can receive, you can uh, make yourself more conscious and aware and so you can get the realization even better. So, so that is their idea. That's perfectly true. There is something exclusive to impersonalism. That is Sattva Guna. See, Sattva Guna, Sattvaat, Sanjayate, Jnana. So if our, our mind is filled with desire, if our mind is filled with fears, then we can't perceive very clearly, isn't it? So, if our mind is running around, oh, this went wrong, what will happen to this, when will I get that? Then we can't pursue things clearly. But when desires and fears are lowered, broadly you can say desires come from Rajaguna, fears come from Tamaguna. Hmm? It's a very broad categorization. Uh, desires, when I feel I can be the controller, then that is Rajaguna. And I feel that, oh, I fear, I just, nothing is in my control, everything is going wrong. That's fear. So, both desires and fears they basically what they do is they crowd and they cloud our consciousness crowd means they fill it and then they cloud we can't see very clearly so this is rajas this is tamas and then if we come to sattva sattva both of these are lowered so then what happens is uh, there is clarity because desires and fears are lowered now can this happen by meditation yes it can happen by meditation so no one is against meditation you know if somebody wants to meditate it's wonderful in co compared to living rajoguna tamoguna any kind of meditation is good so coming to sattvaguna is good but the question here is is meditation the only way to come to sattvaguna bhakti chanting can also get us to sattvaguna and this is not talking about the ultimate reality. See, in one sense, impersonalists and personalists both agree that the desires for this world, they cause the agitation. And for most people, their desires are about this world only. So in that sense, having too many desires is a problem. But saying that desire itself is a problem, that is, is a problem. Isn't it? So, Sattvat Sanjayati Gyan. So it's, it's perfectly true. Much of, so that's why many impersonalists, you know, the wisdom that they give is actually mostly the wisdom that appeals to most people. Is not impersonal wisdom, it is like pre impersonal wisdom. Like impersonalism is beyond Sattva Guna. They just talk sattvic things and people are attracted by that. 
But those sattvic things are very much there a part of bhakti tradition also. Because bhakti also brings us to sattva. You know the three modes, the sattva, the sattva, Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. So like uh, you have talked of the four levels uh, of uh, worshipping like Krishna. So first is like mind and intelligence absorbed in Krishna. And second is mind fixed. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, like we all, uh, almost all like we are on the second level of worship mostly. Correct. So like what is the symptoms of first level and how we should like approach to the first one? Like, first so, level. And Krishna says, if we try to fix the mind on him, by that, gradually, maam icha tum dhananjaya. Our desire will increase. Like a child is very restless. Whenever the mother wants to feed anything to the child, says, no, 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 child is shaking the head. And the child is shaking the head. The mother wants to give something very sweet. But the child thinks, oh, this is some bitter medicine, I don't want it. But somehow the mother tries to hold the neck and the child is shaking the head. Oh, no, I don't want it. But the mother tries to hold the neck and tries to feed still. And while the child is shaking the head, most of the drops are falling out. But a few drops going. And the child is shaking the head. Hey, this is good. <laughs> and slowly, the child stops shaking the head. Ah, and all more and more and more. <laughs> so like that, you know, Krishna is like Sukhataram aparam na jatu jane richarana svarna amrutai natulyam. Krishna is like a shower of nectar. But right now our mind is filled with so many desires that it's going here, going there, going there, all over. But somehow through it all, just a little remembrance of Krishna. If it just keeps going in, we'll start slowly realizing, hey, this is not all that bad. This is good. This is great. This is the best thing. <laughs> so, and then gradually, so from that concentration to absorption. So I said, concentration, hmm, and absorption. It's a journey. So concentration is basically at the level of intelligence. This is good. I know it is good even if it doesn't feel good to. Hmm? So it feels good, maybe not. Hmm? At the level of absorption, it feels good to us. So now, here gradually what happens is, through concentration, it's a progression. First it is, hey, it's not so bad. Sometimes you feel, oh, how can I concentrate? How can I sit for two hours and chant? It's too much. But we do it, okay. Maybe it's not great, it's not great, but it's not so bad. And gradually, hey, this is good. And then, this is great. And after that, this is the best. So gradually our experience, it evolves. So this will happen with time. Okay. Ruji, if a person is doing selfless service with bhakti, so in which platform he comes? He will come. What do you mean by selfless service? Like social services. Then, and what do you mean by with bhakti? Like person is doing chanting and attending Mandalati and also with that, he is doing social service. See, at our level, connecting with Krishna is more important than worrying too much about which level we are connecting with. <laughs> <laughs> it? So, as Krishna says, <laughs> yena kena prakare na mana krishna niveshet. Somehow or other, fix the mind of Krishna. So, it's, it's helpful to understand the levels, but we shouldn't be worrying too much. It like the analysis should be enhancing our devotion, not impeding our devotion. I was in Australia, you know, I was giving a class, and this one boy would come and sit right in front. But throughout the class, not just he would just look at me, not just stare at me, but glare at me. <laughs> and even if there's some humor, the it's like not even a smile would touch his lips by a mile. So, uh, the only way I can give a class over there is, you know, look at everyone except him. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I ask the temple leader, he says, why is he so grave? He says, he's like that all the time, with everyone. 
And then finally I asked him. So he said, oh, I heard that if you do sense gratification, uh, you will fall into Maya. So he says, I am afraid that my laughing is for sense gratification. <laughs> So, oh, I am extremely careful and I have to be that grave so that my mistake also I don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> now I say, you know, you are, you are not going and watching a comedy show or suddenly not an obscene comedy show for laughing. This is within the ambit of bhakti. So, you don't have to worry, is my laughter for Krishna's pleasure or my pleasure? No, just, if it's a part of Krishna's pleasure, laugh. So, like that, focus on connecting with Krishna and then naturally, at what level we can connect that that will that will evolve with us the important point is to stay stay steadily connect with krishna okay. last question yeah you had a question also okay okay we'll discuss tomorrow we'll have a question session later yeah please could you explain text 12 that's too complicated <laughs> maybe we'll talk separately about it See, it's a good question. In see, each book has a purpose. So now the Gita's purpose is about which path to follow. Hmm? That is the primary purpose. Now, how to follow, that is more of a detail, that is only slightly mentioned in the Gita. So the Gita is a book spoken at a particular time in a particular place. It's spoken on a battlefield. Arjuna lives in a spiritual culture. So, Bhakti, Jnana, Karma, all these are known to him. So, Arjuna's question is not how to follow Bhakti. Karjuna's question is what to do, that means which path to follow. That's why in general, it's not only bhakti. This, the, as far as the specifics are concerned, Krishna doesn't give specifics of any other path, also for that matter. Now, how much does Krishna talk about the specifics of Karma Yoga? Krishna is talking about the consciousness in which Karma Yoga is practiced. How much does Krishna even talk about the specifics of uh, Jnana Yoga? It isn't. So, the Gita's focus is it's like, you know, um, suppose a patient goes to a doctor and their discussion is, okay, I have got cancer. Now, should I take allopathy? Should I take naturopathy? Should I take Ayurveda? Should I take homeopathy? So, at that time, the doctor's focus will be on analyzing the various treatments, not giving the specifics of each treatment. Okay, that is a difference. So, books which are focused on bhakti will give the specifics of the path of bhakti. Okay, last question. Okay. <coughs> like you mentioned ki, like, that disturb and not be disturbed in that section. Ki, if we have a strong connection with Krishna, then like we will be able to do that. So could you please more elaborate on that? Like, what do you mean by exactly by having a strong connection? Like how can we cultivate that? Okay, this is will take a little time. I'll answer briefly and maybe then we can uh, discuss it later again. Mm. I'll give a, without getting the specifics, I'll give an example. Say, the, the, the world is a place of dualities. It's like a, if I'm, a, I'm in an ocean and there are waves coming up and down. Now with the waves, I'll go up and down. So now if you consider the dualities can come from things. That means that sometimes uh, uh, the weather is good, sometimes the weather is bad. But the dualities that affect us more are what come from people. Isn't it? You know, how people treat me, do people praise me, do people criticize me, are people welcoming or unwelcoming. So basically, now, if we are in the ocean and the waves are there, then we will be tossed up and down by the waves. But 
if we have an anchor that we can hold on to then what will happen is if we hold on to the anchor and the waves won't shake us so much so our krishna connection is like the anchor and the more we are holding on to krishna then whether people respect me or don't respect me that's not the most important thing so in one sense when prabhupad was in india in vrindavan he was respected he didn't have followers but he was respected he's a sanyasi people people would respect him people would bow down to him people uh, when he came to delhi there are so many well, uh, well to do people who would open their homes you can stay at our home they didn't want to hear his classes and we could follow us and when tropa went to america you know, he had to nobody respected him he man said i guess initially he's a strange old man and he's coming and staying over here so but prabhupad accepted that because prabhupad he for him sarvi krishna was the most important thing okay so thank you very much श्रीमद भगवद गीता की श्रील प्रभुपाद की गौर भक्त वृंद की गौर प्रेमा